So our session today is Governance Models of Open Infrastructure, Building Sustainability and Capacity. Um, I introduce myself and uh, Chris, um, and I'll just briefly introduce um, our speakers because they'll be telling you a lot more about themselves and the organizations um, that they represent. Um, first up will be Ara Ariana Besorel Garcia. She is Director of Innovation and Technology at Redalic. Um, second will be Joy Oango, um, from the Training Center in Communication, TCC Africa, um, and also a board member for Africa Archive. And finally, um, Brian O'Connor, representing the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH. Um, as uh, Chris mentioned, we do have a collaborative notes document. If you want to um, participate, the link is in the chat. So we wanted to give just a brief background on um, why this, this uh, panel and why this session. Um, a little more than three years ago, I was fortunate to participate um, in a workshop called the Joint Roadmap for Open Science Tools. Um, I was working for an open source annotation technology called Hypothesis at the time, um, and we thought it would be wonderful to bring together um, as many open source um, tool creators and open source platforms as we could uh, for a brainstorming session um, out in Berkeley, California over the course of two days. Um, the Joint Roadmap for Open Science Tools continues under the auspices of Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, one of the things we really learned, we learned a lot um, at that session and we had representatives of I think more than 60 uh, different projects. Um, we learned that we needed to um, try harder to have uh, a range of diverse projects. That first workshop was heavily um, US and UK uh, representatives. So that's something um, that we have uh, definitely taken forward um, to try to do uh, a better job on moving forward. Um, we benefited at that session from the fact that um, a lot of these projects had never had the breathing room to talk with each other before. They many times had cross paths at sessions, but they were um, each talking about their project um, and they getting them together in one place. They were saying, you know, who can re recommend a lawyer that understands open source projects? How do you handle benefits for your employees? And um, governance was a key topic um, at that workshop. Um, the second um, impetus from my standpoint um, as to why this was a really critical topic to bring to you today um, comes from time that I spent at the MIT Knowledge Futures Group um, working on an open source platform called PubPub. Um, at that time, um, MIT uh, completed a Mellon funded project called Mind the Gap, which was a wide ranging landscape analysis of open source publishing tools and platforms. Um, it's a fantastic report if you wanna check it out. It also has a catalog of all of the different tools um, that were considered um, putting it together. And a key area identified um, as, a, as a part of that report was governance. It was found that um, it, uh, these are companies that are spending a lot of their time on technical um, issues, a lot of times on business models, but less time on what sort of governance structure might work well for them. So in putting this panel together today, one, we wanted to bring you a wide range of perspectives from around the globe. Um, and we also wanted uh, to talk to folks who have um, other open source um, projects uh, uh, under their belts. Um, and so they might not just be talking about the governance as it currently exists for their organization today, but um, other organizations that they've worked with, different conversations that they've had. Um, so we hope that um, this will be a really informative um, session and uh, collaborative. Uh, so uh, welcome. And with that, I will hand over to our first speaker. Uh, and our moderator, Chris. Uh, so Joy, uh, take us away. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I'm Joy Owango. I'm the Executive Director of the Training Center in Communication, and I also sit on the board for Africa Archive. So the Training Center in Communication is a research capacity organization that has existed in the last 15 years. And what we've successfully done is we've supported researchers in uh, over research, researchers in over 40 countries in the continent, trained over 10,700 researchers. And we've worked with over 80 institutes and we have an active research mentorship group with over 900 researchers from masters to PhD. 
PhD level. So we literally guide researchers in their handholding process, in their research life cycle from research idea to publishing. Next, Chris. Chris, next, or should I share my own slides? Oh, no, I, I, I clicked on next. Yes. Yes. So our objectives is to train, support, and empower researchers, research institutes, and governments on how they can improve their research output and increase their visibility through scholarly and science communication. And that is now where our activities on open science lay, particularly on scholarly communication. By the time you're telling a research institute that they need to improve their research output and they need to increase their visibility, they, what comes to fore is that some of them, most of them do not have the capacity systems to help them improve their research output and access to, and uh, the provision of open access solutions is a game changer for most of them. And it was one of the main reasons why we, opt, we, we partnered with Africa Archive. Next, please. Now, what excites me about this partnership with Africa Archive? First of all, Africa Archive is three years old and um, uh, Africa Archive had originally, since we're looking at governance models, Africa Archive had, uh, is still though a community led organization but did not have any legal, legal structures, did not have any financial frameworks. And when you're looking at governance, you also need to look at aspects of sustainability. How are you going to be sustainable beyond just the community aspect? So that is why TCC came in and part of our partnership is to provide the legal and financial governance to make sure to help support uh, Africa Archive uh, become sustainable in the continent, which is always actually a challenge because we are seeing a, a number of uh, preprint repositories that exist and either they are as assigned to publishers or society. So they have the continuous supports for sustainability. So what about those repositories that do not have that, or even universities? So what about those repositories that do not have that support system? So what our objective was, our main objective was to make sure that we create a model that can be replicated in the global south. And please note, uh, TCC Africa is a not-for-profit organization, but we have a social entrepreneurial model. That is how we've, been, we've managed to be sustainable for the last 15 years. The same kind of model that you see uh, major organizations like ORCID using, because they are not-for-profit, but then they've come up with social entrepreneurship um, models to make them sustainable. But in order for you to have that social entrepreneurship model, you need to have a legal governance. So now we are excited to say that Africa Archive is now housed legally in Kenya, and it is a platform supporting African researchers. And in the last three years, we have received submissions from over 33 countries, 33 African countries. There are 54 countries in the continent. And that is such a huge leap for us. Bearing in mind, you can see the demand for it. And here's the interesting thing. In the last three years, uh, I was looking at data from Dimensions. We have access to Dimensions. The open um, uh, African researchers have been using preprints, and we have over fifteen, and there are over fifteen thousand records, uh, uh, fifteen thousand uh, records, which are preprints that researchers from Africa have used. So it's not, it's not like they're saying no. It's just showing them a platform that they can use locally. Out of this. The bulk of the, the research, 33% of the research that we've, with the outputs that we've, we've, accept, we've received are from social sciences and uh, followed by education and physical sciences and arts and humanities, then followed by the medical sciences and health sciences, agricultural sciences and engineering. And the reality is that they're already using other platforms for, they're using other preprint repositories. So this is not new, but it's encouraging African researchers to use what is there, what is within the platform within the continent, because we are trying to create a situation whereby African researchers have a platform where they can put in their research output. Anyone from outside the continent doing research on Africa can put their platform, uh, their work in the, out in the platform. Now, how does this work? There, we have to be very cognizant of the, of the, and I was in a panel earlier in the day, a FOSS 11 panel on equity and inclusion. And yes, we do have the human capital, we do have the human capital, I acknowledge that, but we are not so strong in the infrastructure. Uh, uh, um, we are not very strong in, in infrastructural, um, for lack of better words, we do uh, support. 
Okay, so you're in a, we're in a situation, we may have the amazing human capital, but the infrastructure systems are still weak. We cannot sit down and wait until when we have better infrastructure systems or we've improved on our infrastructure systems in order to start increasing the visibility of African research. So we decided to look at a continental global approach, which really falls under agenda 2063 the Africa we want. One of the pillars is on collaboration. And we are building on that and looking at what we need as Africans is to increase our research visibility. What partners exist in the global north to help increase the visibility? We picked up a FigShare, OSF, PubPub, Science Open, Chaos, and Zenodo. So Africa Archive not only acts as a platform, but also a gateway for African researchers' uh, research visibility to increase. It's a win-win. We understand the importance of having our own infrastructural systems. But as of now, in 2021, we need to be honest about the situation we are in right now. And we cannot sit down and wait and say that we'll have, we'll wait until when we have our own infrastructural systems. And don't get me wrong, we have some exciting stories that have happened in the continent. So we have Ethiopia with the open access policy. They have a national open access repository system. I am very keen to see how they are going to develop that and how they are using it and, if, and how we can replicate it because that is at a national level. We have Egypt with the Knowledge Management Bank where they have a centralized system where they put all data for the entire uh, uh, community, uh, the entire, uh, anyone who is in, in school to access. And that is a success story. But one thing that is common amongst all this is that they got presidential assent. So we are 54 countries and I'm giving you two good examples that have um, infrastructural systems where you can put all that, uh, your research output or where you can share research output. So of course, South Africa has the same. Rwanda is heading that way as well. And they all have one thing, they have presidential as, uh, support. So as we are waiting to have this uh, infrastructural systems set in place that would help in increasing research visibility, collaboration is key in making sure that we are visible and our work is accessible. That is number one. Number two, we cannot ignore the fact that relying heavily on funding, don't get me wrong, it is important, to, it's another stream of getting revenue, but it is it creates a level of dependence because you do not have a sustainable approach to, to managing the platform. So we have to look at a practical way in which we involve all our community members in owning this process. Okay, and organizations, I still like going back to Orchid. They have successfully done that. They've shown us co-ownership in the community makes everybody own the process and it works. So it's an issue of us saying that we build each other so that we can be visible and we need to work together. It's not one way where we have to number one, heavily rely on funding because if that funding goes, we're in trouble. And this is a model, don't get me wrong. I am genuinely excited and also scared because it has its pros and cons, but it is something I know and I believe that can work and can be replicated in any other part of the world, especially in the global south, who unfortunately we tend to, to be also reliant on funding. So if we have an, a model that makes the community part of the process, they own the process, then they will, they believe, and it has started, don't get me wrong, this is just not hyperbole, this has started, it's already happening, we're already growing our community members. We have a situation whereby they own the process in protecting, in creating their data sovereignty, the data that they store in the platform, but also increasing the visibility of their output. Thank you so much for listening to me. Ah, thank you. So um, next up, um, we have Ariana, if you want to. Um, and, and actually, we have uh, questions in the, uh, in the oh, um, okay. chat. And I, I think like we were going to wait till, till later to, to um, answer them. But um, yeah. Joy, if you, if you want to uh, address I them, can. yeah, that would be great too. All right. Um, 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 I can wait till later. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can you see my screen? Great. Well, yeah. thank you. Uh, my name is Ariana Becerril uh, Garcia. I'm professor at the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico and executive director uh, at Redalic. Uh, and 
I'm very happy uh, and very honored to be invited uh, to join this panel today. And uh, I would like to begin my short presentation just to reflecting a little bit on the open access environment in Latin America, since um, this is uh, very determinant to the way we are building our governance in uh, different uh, initiatives. So just perhaps to, to provide a big picture on uh, how we are performing scholarly communications in the region, uh, I have to remind that um, uh, scholarly communications are sustained mainly by uh, universities, well, institutions, academic institutions in general, uh, with uh, mainly public uh, funded uh, 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 scholarly communications. And this uh, ecosystem, which is sustained by the academic sector, it is enhanced and it is uh, complemented uh, with different uh, initiatives, different uh, platforms, different uh, systems that work to provide added value services and added value benefits to the infrastructure that is sustained by the universities. Well, in terms of uh, publishing and in terms of uh, uh, repositories as well and national legislations uh, on open access. And then these um, uh, different platforms that are providing uh, different uh, services in terms of visibility, edition, quality assurance, metrics, all this ecosystem works uh, uh, on uh, the different key factors like cooperation, networking, crowdsourcing, open source software, I mean, a, with a, a distributed investment, but with a universal benefit, where no a, fees are involved, a, neither for authors or for readers. So this is a non-commercial open infrastructure that is uh, that has been sustained a, regionally and collectively for many, many years. And in this landscape is where, for example, initiatives like Redalic uh, started. 20 years ago. So it is very interesting how, um, and challenging sometimes, how uh, we can uh, build a governance model that can represent the academic nature of this environment, and that can be extrapolated to other regions. Uh, perhaps uh, you know that we are now working with the different uh, regions, not only with Latin America, with, with Latin American journals, so the idea is uh, that we have been working in a science as a global public good approach, which we believe this is healthier for scholarly communications. Uh, we rely on uh, technology and different technologies, well, semantic technologies, artificial intelligence technologies, and different systems that we have been uh, creating and developing collectively to support uh, the sustainability of non-commercial uh, scholarly communications, but also for capacity building for all these uh, open infrastructures. So uh, we have been working on shaping this model around uh, multilingualism uh, to, to, to really uh, achieve a more equitable ecosystem. And these two initiatives, uh, Redalic working uh, from uh, since 20 years ago, uh, that now have uh, more than 1,400 uh, open access peer review journals published by more than 600 institutions from 31 countries. Now uh, it is expanded to index uh, other journals from around the world once they are um, non-commercial uh, open access journals, I mean, non-APC open access journals and quality journals. And AMELICA initiative, which is a multi-institutional community-driven initiative that is uh, supported by UNESCO and led by Redalic and Claxo and more than 20 universities around the Latin American region to, um, a, to extend the, the, the approach of open access that is being uh, is being developed by Redalic to open science and other uh, branches of open science, like, for example, book publishing repositories and other uh, branches of open science. So, uh, sorry, the idea is to, um, we, we, we've been working in a cooperative approach 
relying on technology to provide these, for example, editorial workflows that are uh, assisted uh, by technologies to uh, reduce the cost of uh, publishing, for example, and to help and contribute to uh, journal publishers to uh, keep their business models out of the adoption of APCs, for example. Uh, we are also very focused on quality raising and on providing services on visibility and discoverability. These are some of our numbers just to uh, provide an idea of what, uh, what is our, uh, our impact and our size. Uh, we are providing almost 1 million full text articles uh, uh, in, full, well, in full text. And uh, the, the idea is how to uh, reflect this community uh, uh, sustainability that have been happening in Latin America in a model that provides different added value services that complement the capabilities of a journal, which is uh, published by a university, for example, in the non-commercial sector. So we can uh, provide quality certification and these journal production tools, the XML tagging and interoperability and discoverability and metrics and statistics and some other services that complement these uh, capabilities. And in this sense, uh, we are now uh, working with, uh, and, and for me, it's very interesting to hear the previous panelists talking about uh, African archive because uh, we are working with uh, Angola now in a South-South collaboration uh, in a project supported by UNESCO to um, uh, extrapolate the experience that we have had in the Mexican, with the Mexican government. We work on the national legislation of open access. And now we are working with Angola in terms of, uh, well, uh, providing uh, these um, lessons learned from the Mexican experience and the Latin American experience now uh, to the Angolan region. And we are just in the middle of this project. And in this sense, our governance structure has been uh, evolving very uh, rapidly and uh, sometimes uh, with a very uh, big movements in, in, many, uh, in, many, in, in many aspects because we uh, want to reflect this academic nature. And despite the fact that we have been working in a cooperative approach, the, the governance structure uh, should be formalized in order to give uh, a, coordinate, a coordinated way to uh, all the voices that are being sustaining these two initiatives. So we decided, for example, to uh, have this multi-level uh, governance structure which is uh, based on the, in the case of Redalic, uh, is based on the, uh, on the authorities of the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico, since this university has been the main uh, funder of the platform uh, until two years ago, but now we are receiving uh, more uh, support from other institutions. So we have this contributors committee that have also an impact on some strategic decisions in terms of, uh, well, the future and, and strategic uh, steps that uh, we are taking with Redalic. We also have an advisory board, which uh, is a shared advisory board uh, between Arreda League and the Amelika Initiative, because now we are working uh, with uh, journals and institutions from around the world. Uh, we are focused on Diamond Open Access, and we uh, believe that these two initiatives are complementary. So the advisory board is helping us, uh, providing us feedback uh, about the course of these two initiatives. But in fact, we, they are uh, different in terms of the nature, since Redalic is part of the uh, university as a research, it is started as a research um, a project and now has been evolving and evolving uh, inside and within the university. So it is uh, more focused on um, uh, and, and embedded in, in the university procedures as a research project, which is good uh, uh, the majority of the times because we can uh, secure the non-commercial nature of uh, this platform, for example. And the case of Amelica, which is a civil association, 
uh, with uh, different members from around the world. Uh, it has different structure uh, with uh, different commissions and each commission is in charge of different branches of open science, as I said before. And it also has um, this a committee of members, which is composed of the institutions that are providing uh, funding and uh, collaborating more directly in the decision making. Uh, and this is, for example, the advisory board, which we try to have um, uh, 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 diversity in terms of representation of different countries and different areas and different also uh, profiles of researchers that are uh, working with us in terms of a strategic um, decisions. But it is also very important for us. It is uh, perhaps our angular uh, piece here is the principles and values that have been or that are shared among all the uh, members and all the uh, people who is collaborating in the governance structure, because for us it's very important to uh, share these principles and values and, and then to have different opinions and different expertise, but uh, sharing the, the core, which is based on uh, principles and values. And well, finally, I would like to, to share, and I send my best to Vanessa Proudman, who is the executive director at SCOS. And I would like to share some of the interesting things also that SCOS is doing right now. We are, Redalica and Amelica are part of the current funding cycle at SCOS. And something that is very interesting about this um, crowdfunding selection, it is that uh, SCOS is uh, uh, being, um, well, is uh, perhaps focusing on uh, strengthening the initiatives that they are uh, selecting and helping in, in, in achieving this uh, funding or secure, uh, securing this funding. So one aspect that is very important uh, for SCOS is the governance. And we have seen uh, that different governance structures have been uh, formalized and perhaps have been uh, evolving uh, as a result of participating in these uh, procedures at the SCOS. This is the case, for example, of Redalica Melica, that we have been strengthening our governance structure as part of the requirements of the SCOS and the uh, international community that is now coming to our initiatives to help us support the initiatives. And in this sense, we are just widening this governance structure, but also strengthening in terms of defining all the mechanisms to take decisions and also to, to, to secure the participation or the diversity in the participation in the governance structure. So this is a very good thing that, that is happening uh, as a result of the uh, SCOS work, this coordinated work at SCOS. So just to sum up uh, some ideas um, and lessons learned from our uh, work on uh, governance building at, the, at these uh, two initiatives is that uh, we have been trying to reflect the academy nature of these um, uh, initiatives that we have somehow inherited from the Latin American region, but now that we are working internationally, uh, we are trying to keep this um, academic nature and then our governance structure that are uh, aligned with this uh, academic uh, nature. So, um, it, it is also sometimes very challenging to represent the academic community in terms of uh, geographical diversity and, 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 and other aspects that we have to consider. And it is also very interesting how a, a governance structure should be a, a solid, but as flexible sometimes to evolve and to adapt to the rapid changes derived from the innovation of internet organizations. So it is sometimes very challenging to, to keep adjusting the governance structure. Uh, and it is also very helpful to, uh, to watch over the interest that should prevail. In our case, the interest that we uh, watch over are the 
uh, academic interests. So we have uh, to secure that and the governance structure is a mechanism that is helping, is helping us to do that. So we are always um, have this question in mind, how can governance contribute to the approach to science as a public good? And how can we, uh, how can we work to improve our governance structure that, it, that is aligned with the science as a global public good approach? Uh, this is our main challenge and this is our results so far. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ariana. Um, I, you have uh, two questions at least. Uh, thank you to Richard Dunks and uh, actually Joe Haveman uh, for your uh, questions so far. If you can't see them, Ariana, let me know and I can paste them in the chat. Um, but um, without further ado, Brian, if you want to present now, thank you. All right, let me go ahead and do screen sharing. This hopefully you can see that, and then I'll do full screen. Okay, apologies, my laptop is very, very slow. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, can everyone see it? I can see it. Chris? I think that, okay. that means everyone else can. <laughs> Great, excellent. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian O'Connor. Uh, I'm a PI in the data sciences platform at the Broad Institute and also um, owner of Nimbus Informatics, which is a consulting company that focuses on open source uh, development and standards and interoperability. Um, the hat I'm wearing for today's talk, though, is really all about GA4GH and my, my role there is a co-lead for the cloud work stream. Um, so I'm approaching sort of governance and sustainability from a, a slightly different perspective here. Um, I'm in the sort of standards creation um, within the cloud work stream. We're working on uh, cloud interoperability standards. And so I'm, I'm gonna take a step back and look at the GA4GH as an overall organization, kind of with the lens of um, the work stream, the cloud work stream co-lead um, in terms of how its governance structure and how its sustainability model and how its funding approaches have really helped me and other folks in the cloud work stream uh, build the standards that we want to build, that we you know, hear from the community are, are good to build and hear from our, our drivers um, are, are needed. So that's really what this presentation is about. Uh, for those of you that haven't um, heard of the GA4GH before, it's the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, and it aims to accelerate progress in genomic science and human health by developing standards and framing policy for responsible genomic and health-related data sharing. And I, I know that's quite a mouthful. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm very much involved in the standards piece of this. So how do we build uh, cloud and other interoperability standards that allow for data exchange, that allow for uh, compute sharing uh, across systems, across this ecosystem uh, with the uh, eye towards uh, supporting the overall mission of GA4GH here. All right, so in terms of what GA4GH is aiming to do, uh, we're an, aiming to enable international data sharing, right, through policies and through uh, standards like those coming out of the cloud work stream. Uh, we wanna promote sharing across the translational continuum, the wide spectrum of what's um, out there and to be able to support that and encourage technology enabled federated approaches. And a lot of the work that I do in the cloud work stream along with my uh, collaborators there is to look at how we can work in a federated model um, across the, the, the various um, projects and ecosystems that exist. And then finally promoting interoperability, which I think goes hand in hand with these federated approaches. So systems can talk to each other, whether it's for data exchange or compute exchange or other activities. Um, GA4GH, uh, you know, it works to achieve these aims uh, by doing quite a few different things, um, convening stakeholders, so bringing people together, um, catalyzing sharing of data across various projects, um, creating harmonized approaches, things that can be picked up and, and used, um, acting as a clearinghouse for information, uh, fostering innovation, um, and committing to responsible data sharing. So these are all sort of general themes of of activities um, uh, that are uh, being done to, to move towards these aims. All right, 
so again, apologies for my slow uh, <laughs> transition on these slides. But how do we do that from a more practical perspective? That gave you kind of the high level um, you know, view of, of, of what GA4GH is aiming for um, and at a high level how uh, that's being achieved. But on the level that I and, and other co-leads work, um, we work in, in the concept of, of work streams. And so there are eight work streams uh, through GA4GH. Uh, there's clinical and phenotypic data capture, uh, there's genomic knowledge standards, large-scale genomics. You'll you'll know um, uh, the, the the previous two from things like uh, the VCF standard, the CRAM file. I know uh, many of us on the call may be familiar with these uh, genomic um, uh, file formats. Uh, regulatory and ethics, data security, discovery. Discovery workstream is looking at how we discover data across systems um, in a in a standardized way. Uh, data use and researcher identities. This is how a researcher is identified and their authorizations can be shared between systems. And uh, last but not least, the cloud work stream, uh, which myself and David Glazer um, co-lead. And this is really focused on uh, the data exchange standards, the compute access standards, um, the tool and algorithm exchange standards uh, that help to um, improve, uh, you know, findability, interoperability, accessibility, uh, reproducibility in, in science. Um, so within these work streams, um, our primary goal is to develop standards, as you would expect from the, the GA4GH organization. But we don't do that in isolation. Uh, this is really a partnership with the larger community. And one of the things that um, has been um, a uh, cornerstone of working in these work streams um, has been engagement with what we call driver projects. And driver projects with GA4GH are um, large scale organizations, large scale projects, multinational projects in some case. Uh, but these are, are large projects that have identified uh, the standards uh, that GA4GH is um, pushing forward as being helpful for their work and wanting to support um, the efforts of GA4GH. And the driver projects do that in a few different ways. They um, are providing feedback on existing APIs. Uh, they're proposing new API standards uh, for use in the community. Um, they're um, providing implementations. They're actually uh, taking the standards and then implementing them to achieve things like data interoperability and compute interoperability. And they're also uh, directly engaged with GA4GH. This means that as part of the driver project um, process, they're actually identifying um, point people within their organization for interacting with GA4GH work streams, interacting with a larger organization, um, but also providing that those direct sort of technical uh, contacts. And you can see uh, from this list of driver projects, they're varied. They um, uh, represent a lot of different international projects. Uh, they, rep they really cut across a lot of different aspects of genomic and health uh, data sharing. Uh, on the next slide here, you can get a sense of how these driver projects are actually distributed across the globe. Uh, the G and GA4GH stands for global. Uh, and we really take that to heart. Um, it's not just the driver projects representing um, you know, a, a wide collection of, of projects around the globe. But what's, what's colored in blue here is um, countries from which we have contributors. So the driver projects um, have been instrumental in helping to move uh, these standards that we're creating um, forward in GA4GH, but it's really the uh, individual contributors. Um, any of these work streams are open to anyone that wants to contribute and join in and help out and make their voice heard. So the, the map here is really showing uh, where our contributors are coming from as well. Right now we have representation from uh, 90 plus countries, but there's always an opportunity to continue and a great desire to continue to expand that and have as many contributors as possible join our work streams and make their voices heard and, and, and help us in our, in our mission to create these standards. Um, okay, so that, that gave you hopefully an idea of, of what GA4GH is and, and what are we trying to accomplish. Um, and what standards are we trying to create and how we're doing that through work stream and driver projects. Um, but taking a step back um, as a work stream co-lead and, and, and looking at the sort of governance and sustainability of GA4GH, um, over the last several years, um, you know, I, I've seen really positive movement here in 
uh, the GA4GH uh, governance organization working towards greater sustainability. And from uh, a workstream uh, co-lead perspective, um, this is great because by providing a more sustainable and funded organization, um, a lot of the support that you know, I and the contributors within the cloud workstream need, uh, things like um, outreach, things like communication support, helping uh, to organize hackathons and meetings um, have come from uh, the GA4GH organization. And so that looks like um, on the right-hand side, we have the workstream uh, leads that are helping to, to guide the work streams and guide their work in uh, collaboration with driver projects, as well as the contributors that are coming into these work streams. And on top of that, there's a steering committee uh, and what the steering committee's job is, it's made up of workstream leads and driver project champions. It's really there to provide a checkpoint and to provide extremely useful feedback on the API standards that are going through the process of being turned into a GA4GH standard. So they're there to provide feedback on the APIs, feedback on um, the readiness of those for being um, released as a official GA4GH standards. So that's on the, the right hand side and that's the process and the sort of components of, of how we, we go about building our API standards. On the left hand side, this is really kind of getting at the um, structure that supports that, that support that I was talking about in terms of um, the help that uh, work streams need in order to, uh, to go through this process of creating uh, API standards. And we have the secretariat and that group is uh, consists of workstream managers. Um, uh, these help organize the work streams and keep uh, things that, you know, as mundane as calendar invites and scheduling to make sure that multiple time zones can be, uh, um, um, uh, wor uh, work stream meetings can be accessible to different time zones. Uh, we have the operations team uh, that is working on things like the website and materials um, and infrastructure uh, for us to be able to uh, do our work and share um, our standards. And then the comms team has been instrumental in putting together um, a concise and accessible uh, information about the standards work um, that we do, making that accessible to a, a, a wide range of, 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 of users. And on top of that, there's, an, of course, an executive um, uh, a, a committee along with an advisory board. So that, that gives you an idea of what is this sort of governance structure that's been set up um, to help support the activity of these work streams, to support the activity of these standards and the work um, that's happening in driver projects. Um, making this possible, uh, we the GA4GH has been fortunate to have several organizations acting as host organizations. Uh, back when we had in-person meetings, these organizations would provide, you know, things like meeting space and, and general support. But also funding is important here to make sure this infrastructure behind the scenes that helps uh, work streams and driver projects make progress on standards is really important. And so GA4GH has worked with major international funders like NIH, Welcome, Genome Canada, CIHR, uh, MRC, NIH, uh, uh, R, uh, to uh, support and continue to expand that sort of core funding. Um, in addition, uh, GA4GH has been outreaching to uh, multiple organizations to support um, added work that I think is very exciting over the last year. For example, we have um, new developers coming into GA4GH uh, as an organization to help put together reference implementations that make it a lot easier uh, for new projects coming in or new contributors coming in to understand how the APIs work and how they can potentially adapt them uh, for their, their local institution. So I think that's a, a wonderful way uh, to see an expansion of, of our support there. Um, so at this point, I, you know, I hopefully gave you a good taste of, of what GA4GH is all about and how it's been structured and, and looked for funding to try and address um, the support that's necessary if we're moving um, these large uh, sort of standards uh, forward uh, in, this, in this international context. If you're interested, I definitely encourage you to take a look at our website, uh, contact the secretariat if you're interested in joining, if this aligns with work that you're doing and you're interested in joining any of the work streams, we'd love to have you. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, abbreviations there. 
too. Uh, I don't know how you keep track, <laughs> but um, you also have a question um, in uh, in our Q and A, um, and we do have. Um, so in the meantime, if you wanted to have a look there, but we do have a live. Um, we did have some prepared questions, but that was in case no one had a question, and we do have a question from Yvonne um, Nobis, and uh, so I'm going to allow you to talk because um, I see your hand. Um, so can you? Sorry, that's an error. Oh, it's Sorry. an error. Okay, it's an error. I'm, it was really interesting, and I have lots of questions, but my brain isn't quite working. I must have just clicked on it by mistake. Sorry, I'm <laughs> Man, having uh, perpetual hands. All right, it is perpetual thank hands. But thank you. Oh, can can I answer some of Richard's questions? Yeah, There's yeah, you can you can start, Joy, if you want. Um, okay. and maybe uh, the others can can uh, chime. Right. In. Yeah. So, um, some of the questions I've already answered them in the chat and put them in the chat. Everyone has, has seen them. So the last one, which I was in the process of answering, was he asked, "How do you manage your community engagement in your governance across such a diverse population of users? Never underestimate the power of partnerships." Never underestimate the power of partnerships. So we partnered with Ida Africa. I'm going to put this in the chat. And as a center, what we do is that we train researchers on the scholarly communication aspect. So I'll also put our governance structure. You're going to get the message. Everybody in the chat is going to get the governance structure of TCC Africa, Africa Archive, but also I'm going to share about um, Ida Africa. And Ida Africa, what they do is the next step. And what is the next step? It is supporting the researchers on from the research idea hand-holding process to publishing. In our community, we've had researchers publishing, not only publishing, but finishing their PhDs. These are support systems that would not have been found in a university unless that student was in a sponsored program. Students in sponsored programs tend to have such kind of support. And students who are not, who are self-sponsored when you're doing your master's, you're doing your PhD, it's a hard, it's a, it's a struggle, especially in the global South. And because of that, because of that, we, we join forces with this in this partnership and we offer the training, we support the mentorship process, and then it continues with Ida Africa. And out of that, we are seeing a rollout of, of, uh, of uh, researchers, especially in this community. And again, do not underestimate technology. And this is what Ariane was talking about. The basic technology we are using to manage this entire mentorship program is social media. So we've, we've engaged them actively to the point that every Saturday, they have to present a mock thesis as if they were in a, in a, in a they were presenting it to a postgraduate board. So, okay, you, okay, uh, we have, sorry? so we have a situation whereby researchers pre prepare themselves, even before they're going to give TED Talks, before they're presenting, before they're going to present their actual thesis to their postgraduate boards, they present to us. When they're going through their, 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 their writing process, they come and present to our board every, every week, uh, to, this, to this group every weekend. So it has become institutionalized. So we are having even universities bringing in their students after we train them to the group because it is an existing support system would, which would otherwise not be easily accessible within a university unless, unless they were in funded projects. So such programs exist for only students who happen to be in funded projects and they would get 100% support. But those who do not have, who are not in funded projects, it's a struggle. And that is why you have a, a high dropout rate in at master's and PhD level. Uh, Have I answered your question? Yeah, thanks, Joy. And I, I wonder if uh, that same question can be posed to Ariana or, or, and Brian, or if also you want to speak to a question in the chat that, that spoke to you. But please, uh, please, um, Ariana, if you wanted to, to follow up. Yes, I was just answering another question, but I, I can say it. Yeah. Uh, regarding uh, Richard's uh, question, yes, you identify a very singular and, and very important aspect that we are facing right now. Since Redalic started as a research project, not at a startup, not a non-profit itself, it started as a research project. Uh, I'm a researcher in a university and the majority of the people that work in Redalic are part of the academic world. 
So the, it's, it's sometimes very challenging when we have to, when we are expanding and now we have to include other, well, we want, we have and we want to include other stakeholders in terms of, uh, for example, uh, funders uh, and other interesting uh, 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 stakeholders. For example, we are a very journal center uh, initiative. So our uh, advisory board historically has been uh, built on uh, or with journal editors uh, coming from universities. But now we are uh, facing the challenge to um, strengthening our sustainability coming uh, well with the contribution uh, of different uh, universities and uh, of different uh, libraries uh, that, which are interested in providing uh, funds to the uh, to the initiative and now we have to evolve from a research project to something uh, more inclusive but more international but uh, that can represent the interest beyond the journal editors but the, the libraries and researchers at a wider uh, scope. So we are in the middle of that. How, for example, we are working with uh, uh, forming a committee within the university because uh, first we have to start within the university to help them understand that we are expanding and changing our nature and also working with our closest um, uh, members and stakeholders, the universities and the journal editors that have been working uh, with us for years. And uh, just to reflect on how we can make this change, but it's not easy. But the, the good thing is that, for example, um, uh, we, we are very uh, clear on the goal that we need to keep the academic nature and the non-commercial nature of the initiative. And this uh, sometimes it, it's um, it help us to clarify who members are going to be part and who members are not going to be part. But we are just in the middle of that. Thank you, Ariana. And, and Brian, uh, I know we have this broader question, but also the question you answered uh, separately, whatever question you'd like to answer at the moment. Oh, sure. So I, I was just uh, uh, responding to Richard's uh, question here about um, the sort of, you know, organizational process of, of governance around um, things like GA4, GH that are kind of looking at standards versus maybe a platform or a particular, you know, web-based tool. And, you know, I, I in my response, I was saying um, the, the governance of GA4, GH has had to be very nimble uh, and the sort of support that they're providing in the cloud work streams um, has had to be, you know, nimble as well. So we're looking at things like in early stages of these APIs that we're creating, the standards that we're creating, um, the outreach and the sort of engagement has been primarily to the contributors, to um, the um, uh, uh, driver projects. Uh, but over time, um, as the standards become more mature and become adopted, more of the sort of role of the secretariat and the comms team, for example, has needed to shift to letting the larger community know that these are available and how they can leverage them and how they can improve their ability to do research across systems. So I, I would say that's that's something that's a little, a little bit different, I think, in, in terms of needing to be kind of mindful of the life cycle of, of standards and how the support changes depending on where those standards are in their life cycle. Um, the other thing I would say too is what's been really, really critical is getting early engagement through things like the steering committee of multiple driver projects leaving feedback and giving uh, direct guidance on the API standards. And so having a sort of formalized process of um, uh, the steering committee actually um, approving and leaving feedback on standards and giving advice and helping with revisions as a standard moves through its life cycle and becomes an approved GA4GH um, uh, standard that's been in incredibly useful. So engagement with that, that broader community of driver projects. Thanks, Brian. Um, I was about to share the link to um, our uh, slide deck, um, which has links to the other slides um, in our collaborative notes where we'll share um, the, the Q&A in the chat. Um, but we have time for one more question, I think. Like we have two minutes. <laughs> if anyone has a burning question right now, um, uh, don't, I'm not sure if I see a hand. 
Uh, I have a question to the okay. audience. I have a question for the audience. Um, how do you see African scholarly communication now and in the future in light of what I have shared? We never had this platform ever. And prior to that, the only that exists, the only one that existed was by the Africa Academy of Sciences. So which was only focusing on African Academy of Sciences fellows. So where do you see the future of Africa at this point? This is to the audience. Yeah, and, and also and, the uh, other panelists. We'll be wrapping up soon and I can say- So Monday, I can say Monday. <laughs> and Richard, you can- But they, they can also add their responses in our um, collaborative yeah. notes. Um, so we yeah. can access it later. There was a hand and it just disappeared. Monday, so, it was Monday. It was Monday. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, I think we're at time. So I wanted to thank everyone. I think right, um, just double checking, uh, Heather, right? We're on, yep. we're on time. Perfect. So, thanks everyone. Thanks to our speakers. Um, really, thank you for, uh, for joining us and uh, and Heather, it's been great working with you too. Um, so thanks, thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. And uh, if you have any additional questions or comments, uh, um, you have the, the collaborative doc that we shared in our uh, slides. So thanks, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Take care. Bye.